Hello and assalamu alaikum everyone. A very warm welcome to the Strategic Business Leader Webinar to Success for Exams in September 2022. Today is the day three and the final day and I am your tutor Kashif Kamran. Now just a quick recap. On the day two yesterday, uh, we started uh, looking into the March-June 22 paper and we spent time on how to go about in the first 60 minutes. What exactly you should do in the first 60 minutes, that is the reading and planning time, because that is the most critical. Now, the one hour of the effort and the one hour of the investment is the central idea of the day two. And that is extremely important because I did emphasize at the end of the day two that the amount of investment you do in the first one hour or the amount of effort sorry, you do in the first one hour would really count because after one hour you should have a very good looking word processor in the word processor everything should be in the word processor everything copy pasted everything organized you know what to do with task one two three four five you know which exhibits to connect with. You have taken information from every exhibit and dumped into the uh, task one, two, three, four, five. And after one hour, that word processor becomes your launching pad for writing a very good answer. And that's where I need to connect things today and even looking at the examiner report as well. So the day three today, again, looking at the same paper, March, June 22 and we will go a bit further today, not just in terms of how you should write an answer, but more importantly, looking into the examiner report as well. So let's start the day three of the webinar to success for SPL and let's see what we have in store for all of you. The day three would continue with the drill and the drill would continue looking inside the reading and planning time and the writing time. More importantly, the writing time because we spent a, a, a good amount of time in terms of how to go about reading and planning on day two yesterday. Critical review of the examiner report and the marking scheme would come again. The marking scheme was uh, clarified yesterday, where to fetch two marks, where to fetch one mark. I hope if you listen to the day two carefully, you will be in a better position to understand the marking schemes for the SPL paper, which is not very difficult, but a critical review of the examiner report should come today because that is something we missed upon on the day two. So this should come today and more about the writing time, which is critical. Let's let's go back and let's see where we were yesterday. OK, I hope you can see in front of your screen the practice platform. Please confirm that all of you. This is something uh, I have been investigating uh, on the day two, looking at the practice platform, right? Thank you. and. We read through the right hand side of the screen. That is something I mentioned yesterday. Then we went into looking at the task one, two, three, four, five. We evaluated every task, what to write, how to write, the number of marks, dividing by two, dividing by one, which format to use. And I hope you got a lesson yesterday for the professional skills which are to be demonstrated. And a lot of times the student has a fear factor about how to go about demonstrating the professional skills when they're so easy because examiner will be telling you every possible time how to demonstrate them. So you're not learning the meanings and definitions of the skills, rather you're trying to demonstrate them in the manner the examiner wants you to demonstrate them. So I hope you got these learnings from yesterday. If you can just please confirm that. So we start the day three and the final day. Now, I used the word processor yesterday. I hope you can see that in front of your screen. I consistently kept the word processor on the right side of my screen yesterday, and I kept opening the task one, the task two, the task three, the task four, the task five, but my word processor was constant. I hope you got that message that when you are doing an SBL paper, keep the word processor static on the right hand side of the screen and then you keep opening exhibits and tasks on the left side and opening closing opening closing but one thing which will be with you from the very first minute of the exam to the last minute of the exam is your word processor because you're dumping 
and you're writing and you are doing every possible thing under the word processor. Apart from that, if you might be using the spreadsheets and slides, because in the exam paper we are looking for, the March, June 22 exam paper, there was no need of a spreadsheet and a slide because everything was either a briefing note or was a letter or was a report. So when you're writing a letter or a briefing note uh, or, a, or, or a report, you don't need to go into the spreadsheets and the slides unless and until the examiner gives you a particular requirement in the exam paper where you have to develop the slides and you have to open the response option for slides as well. Okay, now you can look at a uh, look at in front of your screen, the task number one, while we were reading that yesterday, we tried connecting it with exhibit three. We got that you need to write a letter in the task number one and you need to assess the benefits, uh, the proposal, right, of establishing a strategy committee. And we had 14 marks. Now, when we looked at the professional marks yesterday, the professional marks guided us that we need to assess the benefits and the problems. So while you are evaluating the proposal of the chief executive officer to establish a strategy committee, you should focus on not just the problems, but the benefits of the proposal and establishing the committee and you move further. This is the point I copied yesterday with all of you. Uh, the point one to six, while I was reading the exhibit number three, I got, got these points from the exhibit number three which will help me formulate my answer. There were more information in the exhibit three, but in the limitation of time, I did not read through it. Now, just one quick suggestion. Suppose you're starting to write an answer for task number one in the exam, and you need to write a letter, right? So you put the heading letter, and under the heading of the letter, you start writing the letter. Now, just confirm that who was writing the letter to whom. Write a letter, replying to the chief executive, right? So this letter is being written by the consultant, right? And we are the consultant from the, uh, from the Tr Tran Art Consultant. So Tran Art Consultant, that's what we are in the case study. And we are writing a letter to the chief executive officer. So let's see how we will be writing this letter to the chief executive officer in the word processor. So you put the heading letter. Now, whenever you are writing a letter, always on the right hand side of your letter, you write the name and address of the person who is writing the letter. So in our case, uh, you are writing this letter and you will take the right alignment and on the right alignment, you will be writing uh, Tran Art Consultant. That's the one who's writing the letter and you can put the date March, March 20X2. So Tranat Consultant is the one writing the letter and it, they're writing the letter on March 20X2. If you want to leave a line under the Tranat for address, you can just say address line and you leave it blank. Address line and you leave the address line blank because you don't know the address. So you can do this in exam paper, right? Tranat Consultant address line March 20X2. So that's on the right hand side is the is the person writing the letter. Then you come to the left side and on the left side of the letter, you write the name of the person to whom you're writing. Now, Tranat Consultant is writing a letter to the chief executive officer. So you can directly say, dear, dear chief or dear chief executive, something like that. Or you can also put the name of the chief executive if you want to. I think the name of the chief executive, if someone remembers, uh, I think if you can just pick up the name of the chief executive officer. The name of the chief executive officer was Tony. Tony Bersham. Tony Bersham is the name of the chief executive officer. So when you're writing a letter, you can directly put the designation, dear chief executive, or you can put dear Tony. And that's how you start writing the letter because it's been written from a consultant, right? So the consultant would say, dear Tony, or the consultant would say, dear chief executive. So whichever you want to go down with. So you start that way. Now, under the dear, you would put the subject. Now, the subject of writing the letter here is to assess the proposal to establish a strate strategy committee. Establishment of a strategy committee. So that becomes your heading. 
Now, every time you start writing a letter, you should start writing a letter from an introduction because the Tran Art Consultant will be giving an introduction. What is the purpose of writing this letter? So you start with a purpose of writing the letter without giving the heading of introduction. So under the subject, the Tran Art Consultant will tell the Chief Executive Officer, why are we writing this letter to you? The purpose of writing the purpose of writing this letter is to assess the proposal put forward by you because you're writing to the chief executive officer you're saying the purpose of this letter is to assess the proposal put forward by you uh, to establish a strategy committee to establish a strategy committee. This uh, assessment will look for not just the benefits of the committee, but also the problems, but also the problems associated with the, with but also the problems associated, full stop. So you're writing a letter and you're telling the chief executive officer that the purpose of writing this letter is to assess the proposal put forward by you to establish a strategy committee. This assessment will look for not just the benefits of the committee you are proposing, but also the problems associated. The benefits of the committee you are proposing, but also the problems associated with it, full stop. Now you go down into the headings now, when you look at the professional marks, the examiner wants you to do two things from the day two, the benefits and the problems. So, and you know, you have to write a total of seven points. You can write more benefits and less problems or the vice versa. Now, under the introduction, you put the heading benefits and you put the heading problems and you go down in the, in the exam, writing the conclusion because you can then, you can then fill up the answer benefits, problems, and then you go down and say, uh, when, when you complete the problems, you will write the concluding line of the letter. And the concluding line of the letter could be, uh, if you have any further queries, you can contact us anytime. If you have any queries, you can contact us any times and looking forward to hear from you soon. Yours sincerely, that's how you end the letter, right? Yours sincerely and you put consultant. There's no name of a consultant, consultant. Yours sincerely, consultant. Now look at this end of the letter. The letter always end with a concluding line because you're writing a letter. So you're telling the person that even after reading my letter, if you're unsure about something, you can contact me anytime and you're more than welcome. You're sincerely consultant. Now you start a letter with the subject. You start a letter with the address, address of the person writing it on the right hand side. You start it with the dear to whomever you are writing. You put the heading letter here and you write the purpose the purpose of writing the letter right here. You put the heading benefit, you put the heading problems, and this is how the answer looks like. Now in the exam, you can first structure the format and then you can fill the format. That's a more easier approach. I hope, I hope you, will, uh, you like this approach, right? You first fill, you first structure, then fill. Now see, you put the benefits and the problems here. Now you can go filling down. So benefits underline, problems underline, and you can start writing under them the problems and benefits. Now, just a thought, for example, you're writing a benefit. And one of the benefit is that the point we got yesterday while we were reading the exhibit number three is it will be, it will be separate to the committees which we will have to establish when we obtain listings. So this is an incremental committee, right? Now, this is apart from the audit committee, the risk committee, the nomination committee, the remuneration committee. So it is an incremental committee. And probably when you have an incremental committee, uh, that is something special. Uh, you, will you will give a very specific focus to that committee. And I think 
when you are creating something uh, out of the corporate governance requirement, that means it suits the need of the organization. And they really need this uh, strategy committee because they're facing a lot of competition from their competitors. They, they have a very volatile competitive environment. Uh, I think they've already taken a decision to uh, uh, enter a new market. If you have read the exhibit number one and two, so on and so forth. So when you're developing a point under the letter, for example, uh, it will be separate to the committees, which will be established when obtaining a listing. So my first point would be point number one. It is a uh, it is an extra committee. And you write under this. The uh, strategy committee will be an extra committee apart from the ones required by corporate governance. Pull a stop. The strategy committee will be an extra committee apart from the ones required by corporate governance. This committee uh, suits the uh, situation of the Yex Marine Company as currently they are facing lots of strategic challenges, lots of strategic challenges, which needs a clear focus and determination. The, the, this committee would help uh, look into the challenges faced by company more carefully, including the competition, including the competition from, including the competition and the entry into the new, and entry into the new market, Limpool, Limp, Pool, full stop. I, I just, uh, this is just an answer, which is coming not just from the exhibit number three, but they have some competition given in exhibit number two, and they're facing some challenges as well. And that's the reason they want to ensure they have a strategy committee, which can give them a clear focus for the future. Now, this is just an idea. This is not a, this is not an answer you sh should just stick to, but look at the situation here. I have one full stop. I have my second full stop and I have a third. So this is like three sentences three sentences and a good statement is three to four sentences long so if you write one paragraph which is three to four sentences you are developing the point very well from an examination point of view three to four not less than this so you are fetching that good two marks here because you're trying to tell what is the benefit of this extra committee to yex marine company why they want to establish this extra committee because it's facing lots of challenges. You can give examples of those challenges from the case study. Examiner likes the student to give examples, not examples out of the case study, but examples within the case study. So you can quote some challenges, you can quote some issues the company is already facing. That is something the examiner likes. So whenever you are writing an answer, you can give examples. Examining team likes examples. But again, again, I'm clarifying, these are examples from within the case study, not out of the case study. I hope you're all clear with that, right? Now, just one more situation before I tell you something more important. Problems. Now, one of the problems we identified yesterday was that the composition was very inappropriate. They don't have the HR director in the committee. They don't have the finance director in the committee. They even didn't have the non-executive directors because if you are formulating a committee and a corporate governance, which is even an extra committee, you need to have an independent viewpoint. If you just keep the executive directors in the, in the committee, they are not giving an independent viewpoint. You need to have some independence in the committee as well. And that is one of the problem, even if you look at the composition of the committee. So some of the directors are missing and they even don't have the non-executive director. So we can write one point in the problems about the composition. Composition.
composition and see what I write under composition. The composition of the, com of the strategy committee proposed by chief executive uh, seems inappropriate as there are certain there are certain directors there are certain directors who are missing from the committee membership from the committee membership such as see you're giving examples such as the finance director and the human resource director. Now you will tell why these two are important. Otherwise, you're not getting points. You're saying some of the directors are missing. Now the examiner will be more interested in knowing what's the implication of these missing directors. Finance director is important to support the financial side of any decision which will be taken by the strategy committee and the absence would hinder and the absence would hinder uh, taking a sound decision which taking a sound decision which is financially viable so you cannot take a financially viable decision unless and until you have the finance director as part of the committee. Moreover, uh, if the human resource director is missing, uh, the, the sound decision on future course of actions, on future uh, course of actions will be uh, inadequate without knowing availability of resource, without knowing availability of human resources. Will you have human resources available in future or not? And how much? So that would be difficult. So look at this paragraph now. It's almost like stretching up to, I think we had, again, three sentences here. So we had a three sentence long paragraph here, making it worthy for getting two marks. Now, every time you write a para in SBL, please ensure it is of three to four sentences long to be a well-developed para. Number one. Number two, you should ensure what whatever you are writing in that para, you are connected with a case study. Number three, you are ensuring that wherever you want to give examples, do give them, but they have to be from the case study. And number four, for example, you're saying, the committee does not have a finance director full stop. That is not a well-developed point. Unless and until you tell that what is the significance of having a finance director in the committee. So if you say something is wrong, then why? If you say something is missing, then justify what is the importance of that missing in the context. So if you're not writing the implications, you're not writing the significance, you're not trying to write the importance of something, you're not giving examples, you're making a weak answer. So when you're developing a point, the point development is extremely critical. I hope you're getting this point here, right? Just let me write something on my word file for day three, which we are learning today. I hope you can see the day three word file in front of you. Uh, we are moving towards the writing, uh, writing of the answer today. Writing of the answer. And in terms of writing of the answer, the first thing which is coming in my mind is the one you need to focus on, number one, is the development of a point to fetch two marks. Now, when you're developing a point to fetch two marks, what are the attributes of that? What are attributes of a good two mark para? The first, I believe, is it has to be case oriented. What Ever you are trying to explain is coming out of the information presented in the exhibit. Your para should 
give examples from the case where needed, where needed, not necessarily, not necessarily in each point. If you are trying to explain something which is important or beneficial, then do justify why it is beneficial or important in context of the company, in context of the case situation. And lastly, if you are trying to explain some issue or some weakness or you're trying to explain some issue or a weakness or a shortcoming or a problem or a challenge, etc. Try to justify why it is so, why it is an issue, why it is so, why it is a weakness, why it is so, why it is a shortcoming, why it is so in the context of the case and also put in the implication. What is the implication of that issue? What is the implication of the shortcoming? What is the implication of the problem? Now, if you don't have a finance director as part of a strategy committee, what is the likely implication of that? You might be taking a decision which later turns out to be not very financially viable. Or you might take a decision when later you come to know that you don't have the finance available. So is that clear to all of you? Writing the answer, fetching the two marks. But please ensure that when you start writing the answer, first give a structure of the answer. Suppose you need to write a letter, then put a structure of the letter with introduction, with conclusion, your sincerely, the address, dear, and then you start filling up the letter. That makes the life easier. So in that way, you will, get, uh, you will keep gaining the confidence. Now try to understand one more thing. Please ensure you wrap up these answers when, uh, when this webinar ends. Now, once you write the proper answer for letter from here to here, with your sincerely everything in the exam. Now, once you completed the task one, what will you do in the exam? You will remove all of this from here. You will remove all of this from here, control X. And see, this looks like a beautiful written task number one now. And you can just write here, answer to task one and remove this word exhibit three. Now see how good this word processor is looking like? Can you just give me your replies? Is, is this understandable to all of you? Now in the exam, you will remove all the brainstorming. You will remove all the points you have written while you were in the first one hour after you have formulated the answer. Now look at how neat my answer is looking like and everything at the back of the letter the points I wrote, the brainstorming I did, the number of points I need to write is have all been deleted from the screen. Now, what will go in front of my marker? Answer to task one, letter. And my marker would look at my letter and give me points, give me marks on this. And you finish off with the task number one. Is everyone clear? Any issues you'd like to discuss or uh, want to ask me before I proceed further? Okay, great. Now I'm just putting, I'm just putting uh, what I have deleted back because again, this file has to come to all of you, but I've guided you that once you write the answer, you delete everything, right? So I simply press the control Z and everything I deleted will come back on the screen, right? So this is uh, the, the file which has to come to you. So I'm not deleting anything. So you benefit from it. Now, just let's do one more effort here. We go down and we do another task. I'm not doing the task two, not the three. I will be interested in doing the task four. I hope you can see in front of your screen the task number four. Prepare a report for the chief executive, which evaluates the assessment made for each risk and its potential impact. Evaluate the adequacy of the risk mitigating activity and recommend further. Now see how many things we have to do for every risk 
So we need to write a report to the chief executive officer. And let's let's quickly open the task number four to see who was writing it. The ex marine chief executive wishes to obtain an independent assurance that the company is taking sufficient steps to mitigate risk. The chief executive has selected two risk and he has concerns and has asked the operation manager to assess them and recommend how they should be managed. The chief executive wants you to evaluate the assessment which the operation manager has supplied. So you means I am again the consultant. So consultant is writing this report and the consultant is writing this report to the chief executive officer. So I will just quickly formulate my report. I will put the heading in exam report to from, we know the report starts in a very formal way to from date and subject. So it's to the chief executive, to the chief uh, executive officer. If you want to again put the name, Tony, uh, and you put the full name in the exam, Tony, whatever. It's from uh, the consultant who you are in this case. It's from the consultant date. You can assume it is the March 20X2. That's what the examiner is telling us, 20X2. And the subject is... Uh, if what is the subject, prepare a report which evaluates the assessment made adequacy. Okay, evaluation of risk assessment. Evaluation of risk assessment. Okay, now every time you start writing a report, you need to give an introduction. Again, what is the purpose of writing the report? Now, under the report, when you give the introduction, you have a risk number one, you give heading, and you have a risk number two, you give heading. Now you go back to the exhibit number, exhibit number six, and you put the headings. I hope you can see the exhibit number six in front of your screen now. The first uh, risk is the flooding risk, and the second risk is product obsolescence. Product obsolescence. So I just give the headings. The risk number one is the flooding risk in my report, flooding risk. And the risk number two is product obsolescence, where I have to work on product obsolescence. Product obsolescence, right? Now, for every risk, what I have to do, number one, evaluate the assessment made. So I need to evaluate the assessment made, number one, of, of each risk and its impact. So I need to assess flooding risk uh, assessment and flooding risk impact. So I need to evaluate the assessment. I need to evaluate the impact, evaluate the adequacy of the risk mitigating activity. So evaluate the assessment, evaluate the impact, evaluate the mitigation, evaluate the mitigating activity taken by the company, mitigating activity. And then I have to give a recommendation recommendation for further mitigations. What further mitigations can be taken? So I need to assess uh, the uh, assessment of the management for flooding risk. If the management is saying the flooding risk is low, I need to assess why. I need to assess the impact of the management. I need to assess the mitigating activity of the management. And finally, I need to give a recommendation. The four headings would also be under the second risk. So I'm just formulating my report. And the report has to end with a conclusion. So you will give a conclusion at the end of the report. There's no your sincerely something like that. You just write a conclusion at the end of the report and it ends. Conclusion and you end the report. So firstly, when you know what you have to do in the first one hour and you're getting into the three hours now, you just read, you just open a task, you just structure the layout of the task, you just fill up the headings and the subheadings in the task, and then start writing the answer. Is, is this approach becoming understandable to all of you? So you put the heading, you put the structure, you put the introduction, then you just need to fill, fill things up, right? Okay, now let's go down, do one of the risk, and you do the second one yourself. Risk number one, the flooding risk. Okay, now the information is not just coming from exhibit six. The exhibit six is telling us about uh, the assessment of the flooding risk, but in exam, 
when you will reach the exhibit number six, you must have read five, four, three, two, one, because in exam, eventually you are reading all the exhibits, right? So there might be a certain information in a certain exhibit, which might help you with the exhibit number six. Now, for example, you open up the exhibit number six and it tells you in the exhibit number six, that the flooding risk, the level of the risk is non-serious, not serious, sorry. So the assessment of the management is that it is not a very high likely risk. It's not a very serious risk. And what is the potential impact? Temporary interruption of business. That's what they think is the impact. So they think this is like a low likelihood risk, not a serious one. And the potential impact of this is low temporary interruption to business. Is, is the management assessment right? because the examiner wants us to be skeptical in the task number four. We need to use the skeptical skill here, right? Question management assessment, question management assessment, skepticism. So let's do down this exercise. Now, I think there is a information in the employee satisfaction survey result. Uh, and even in the, uh, Employee satisfaction, exhibit number four. The company is going to a new location in the near future. And there is some problem with this, which is given in the exhibit number four. I'm just reading one sentence from exhibit number four. I hope you can see that in front of your screen now. Exhibit number four. Right, the exhibit number four tells us The first paragraph here, employee seems journally uh, moved to Limpool, right? The company is moving to a new location, which is Limpool. That's given in the exhibit number one and two as well. Move to Limpool. Employee seems journally to accept the reason for selling the two sites and merging operations into one big site. So employees are happy with you uh, merging things up and moving on. However, a few employees raised the issue of the flooding in Limpool last year and forecast that flooding in the area will become more frequent with the severe global warming. So they're moving to a new location, Limpool, where flooding has been in the last year. And there are forecasts that the floodings will become worst in the years to come. Now they're moving to a new location, Limpool, uh, where uh, there is a significant risk of floods which can destroy your properties, destroy your equipment, destroy your assets, which cannot even have a temporary suspension of a business, a very long-term suspension of the business. So I think we need to be critical of the information given in exhibit number four and contradicting that with the information given in exhibit number six, not serious. So when you start writing the report, in the report, you write the introduction. And in the introduction, you say, again, the purpose, the purpose of writing this report is to assess the uh, is to evaluate the assessment of risk performed by the operational manager operational manager the purpose of writing this report is to evaluate the assessment of risk performed by the operational manager and to critically uh, review whether the assessment is whether the assessment is right or wrong giving further recommendations giving recommendations on further mitigate giving recommendations on further mitigating activities the company could adopt the company could adopt full stop right <clears throat> so this is the introduction the purpose of writing this report is to do this and to give further recommendation now you come to the risk number one flooding and you look at the assessment under the heading of the assessment you write the operational manager has concluded that the risk of flood is non-serious, is non-serious means that 
the likelihood of the floods is low. It is justifiable. It is justifiable to a certain extent that predicting floods is difficult. However, see how I am questioning, how I'm in the skepticism mode. I'm saying to a certain extent, you're fine that predicting floods is difficult. So we cannot, we cannot be very sure whether it will be serious or non-serious. However, with the information, with the information available, with the information available about the new site where uh, Yex Marine Company will operate, where Yex Marine Company will operate, Limpool. The, the flooding is already a reality in past and the forecast shows more severe floodings in future due to climatical changes. So I'm questioning the assessment. I'm saying the operational manager is including that the risk of flood is non-serious and he believes that the likelihood of the flood is low. It is justifiable to a certain extent that predicting floods is difficult. However, with the information available about the new site where the Marine company will operate the limp pool, the flooding is already a reality in past. And the forecast shows that more floodings will, uh, more, more floods in future due to climatical change. Thus, the assessment of non-serious non-serious is inappropriate. Follow stop. See, assessment. I, I, I took the tone of skepticism. I hope you're understanding. Can, can you understand my tone from here to here that how I use the tone of questioning and being skeptical? Uh, are you all clear with the, uh, with the answer? So you're critically evaluating the assessment undertaken by the operation manager. Right now, impact. What is the impact the operation manager is telling us? The impact the operational manager is telling us is what? He's saying temporary interruption of business. Now, that looks illogical because if the floodings is to increase and you are moving to a new location, and the new location you're moving to is Limp Pool, where floods will be a more, uh, will be a reality there will be a significant amount of damage to your properties because we know it's difficult controlling floods. We know the, the floods can cause a significant damage to the property, plant and equipment and the infrastructure, not just at the level of a company, but at the level of a country. And if there are more floods predicted to come in limp pool, it is a natural, it is a national disaster, right? And the national disaster would eventually impact all the businesses in limp pool. And one of them is the Yex Marine Company. So impact, the assessment of impact by the operational manager seems inappropriate as the manager believe there will only be a temporary suspension of business, which is illogical, considering floods uh, cause significant damage. Floods cause significant damage, not just to the property, plant, and equipment, but also to the continuity, but also to the continuity of the business operations, which also impact upon sales and profitability, profitability of the company. 
So the flood is not just damaging the infrastructure, right? The flood is causing a suspension of your business for a certain time, which can, could be months, depending how quickly you have a contingency plan to overcome it. But in that point in time, you will be impacted, your sales will be impacted and your profits will be impacted. So the assessment of impact by the operational manager seems inappropriate as the manager believe there will be on, there will there will only be a temporary suspension of business, which is illogical considering flood cause significant damage, not just to the property, plant and equipment, but also to the continuity of the business operation, which also, which also impact upon sales and profitability of the company full stop. Thus, uh, the floods uh, in Limpool can cause uh, can cause a significant impact a significant impact on the operations of the Yex marine company and again this is a, an answer just been wrote in a limitation of a webinar but just to guide you this is how you have to go down writing the answer under the heading of assessment under the heading of impact and then you go down writing the mitigating activity is the mitigating activity taken good or bad let's see what mitigating activity the company is taking for floods exhibit number six the mitigating activity they're taking for flood is insurance because they're considering it a low likelihood and a low a low impact. Local flood defense, they will coordinate with the government for the local flood defense, whatever the government is doing in Limpool and watching for the flood warnings. Seems good, good right? For the floods, we can be watchful of the warnings, which seems fine. You can look at the national weather reports for the upcoming floods. You can coordinate with the local government for the defense systems of floods, what the government is doing, you can coordinate with them and insurance. But let's see what is the issue here. The uh, insurance as a risk mitigation activity is good only when the chance of a risk, when a chance of a risk is low in likelihood low in likely low in likelihood and with big impact however considering the situation considering the situation above the flood risk is high likely and insurance cost will increase for company with insurance cost will increase for company if they opt for insurance as a mitigation for high likely risk i hope if you read the books very well uh, insurance is a good mitigation when you have a low probability and high impact but you will not like to have an insurance with a high probability and a high impact because you will be increasing the frequency of insurance premiums and you will be increasing your insurance cost as well. And the company wants to do something when, when a risk is highly probable rather than just relying on insurance alone. So normally insurance is done for low likelihoods and high impacts, but not for high likelihoods and high impacts. So the insurance as a risk mitigation activity is good only when the chance of risk is low and with a big impact. However, considering the situation above, the flood risk is high likely and insurance cost will increase for the company if they opt for insurance as a mitigation for a high likely risk. Full stop. The other activities, the other activities like uh, local, def local flood defense and uh, flood warnings, uh, are good enough to be prepared beforehand. The rest are good, right? I, 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 that, that's perfectly fine. You're not criticizing everything. If something is good, it's good, right? And now you recommend further. What further would you recommend? What should the company do? I believe uh, considering you're moving to limb pool where there is a high frequency of floods, uh, the Yex Marine Company, the Yex Marine Company, 
needs to be careful uh, with the frequency of floods in future at Limpool. And the company should prepare a proper contingency plan, a proper contingency plan uh, in wake of floods as to how to continue the business operations, as how to continue the business operation. The contingency plan should focus on the, uh, the safety of the property plant, property plant and equipment as much as possible and ensuring uh, evacuation, evacuation of uh, equipment to safe locations, to safe locations uh, at the initial, at the initial flood warning. So if you get an initial flood warning, you should have a plan to move your equipment to a safe location. You should transport your equipment to a safe location. That would be very important. So a lot of time the company do take such steps, right? That uh, a week before or 10 days before knowing the flood will come in uh, and you see the water level risings uh, in, the, in the local rivers, you can just move out your critical equipment, transport them to a near location where the flood warning is low and you can bring them back at least you're saving your equipment uh, from uh, damage, from obsolescence, and uh, and you are reducing your cost of buying the new equipments again. So this is a recommendation apart from the one the company is doing. Now see how you're structuring your answer. Risk number one, flooding. You're looking at the management assessment. You're looking at the management impact. You're looking at the management mitigating activity in a questioning manner. And then you're recommending the one you would like further. In the same way, you go with risk number two and you wrap up the answer. And in the conclusion, you write uh, based, upon, based upon the assessment above, Yex Marine Company, Yex Marine Company should um, ensure that uh, changes are made to risk assessment Changes are made to risk assessment and impact in light of findings above, in light of findings above, so to have a proper risk management, so to have a proper risk management in place, full stop. So the Yexperian company should reassess their uh, risk impact and risk levels based upon what the consultant has guided them so on and so forth. Then you wrap up the answer. Now look at my paragraphs. Again, they're meeting the definition of a good paragraph. Look at the length of each paragraph. You cannot write less than this. You cannot write less than this for one point in SBL. Look at the way I'm writing the answer. I'm using headings. I'm using subheadings. I'm putting the right structure. I'm trying to develop my point, which is connected with the information coming out of the case study, and you move on this way. Uh, you can copy sentences from the case, but you cannot copy a paragraph from a case. Even if you're copying a sentence from a case, you need to redraft, rephrase. You cannot just copy paste a sentence and leave it as it is in your answer. No, if you're copying a sentence, you can do it but the copying has to translate into rephrasing. The copying has to translate into your own words to, to impress the examiner. But if you're just copy pasting without rephrasing, without retranslating into your own words, and you just leave the copy paste as it is, examiner is not impressed. I hope you're clear with this, right? Is everyone sound with the discussion so far? Taking on the last element of our discussion, Are you gaining some confidence? 
since the start of the session today? Are you gaining some confidence about how to execute an answer? Are you finding some ways of structuring the answer before you write it? So I, I hope you, you uh, are part of it now. So when you're writing an answer, the first thing is development of a point, right? Now, the second thing is when you're writing an answer, you need to ensure structure Rather, I will bring this point above uh, the development. Structure the answer in the right format, and fill the and fill the format with all the essential headings. Fill the format with all the essential headings. Uh, fill the format with all the essential headings required, including. Uh, intro and conclusion where necessary, including con intro and conclusion where necessary. Before you start to fill in the answer in the right format. So first structure the format, right? First ensure the structure of the answer. Structure the answer in the right format before you fill it up. Uh, so this should come even before you are developing a point. So even before you develop a point, you should structure your answer in the right format. Then you start putting up the answer and you start developing a point. Uh, ensure you are using headings and subheadings as the examiner likes them. As examiner, uh, consider them as part of journal professionalism in SBL paper, which is rewarded, which is rewarded. And I hope you want to do everything which gets rewarded in SBL. Now, the last thing before we take the next step is to understand that you can copy paste a certain statement or a, or a sentence or a sentence from any exhibit while you are developing a point or explaining or explaining a point. However, ensure that the sentence copied is modified or redrafted or rephrase in your own words to impress marker full stop leaving a copy paste without doing anything in your answer is useless and will fetch no marks and will fetch no marks. Please read this bullet last and tell me, are you clear with what I tried explaining here? Are you understanding the language or the explanation? Just, get, just spend five minutes on this last bullet here and tell me, are you clear? Because this is a very big problem in SPL, right? Because you, a lot of time the student copy paste a lot. I'm not denying copy paste till the time it translates. Even I put the important points of the state of the strategy committee yesterday, but I converted those important points into my answer, rephrasing the, the task number one, right? The task number one I wrote today benefits and the problems of the strategy committee. The points are taken, but the points are redrafted as if you're writing your own answer. Is everyone clear with the bullet number last on your screen? Highlight it. Okay, so. See, this is exactly what I would try to tell you here, that when I was writing the task number one right here, I, I, I took the points while I was reading the exhibit, right? Yesterday, agree? These points written on the screen, one, two, three, four, five, six, have all come from reading the exhibit. But when I started writing the letter today, I just took separate to the committees. So I thought, oh, this is an extra committee. I just took the heading extra committee and I wrote under, in my own words, so I can just convert the copy paste into a heading, a central idea. 
And then I need to uh, stretch on that central idea. I need to write on that central idea to fetch good marks. So this is the way you have to go down with. So please ensure, again, the investment of one hour is very, very useful. I hope you got this message and you will go with this message in exam hall. The first one hour, reading, opening the word processor, reading the task, copying the task, breaking the task, knowing what to do in a task, which format to put, the number of marks, should I divide it by two, should I divide it by one, what skills to demonstrate, how to demonstrate skill, reading the exhibits, connecting the exhibit with the task one, two, three, four, five, six, dumping, 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 dumping of points, and you, the one hour comes to an end. And after that one hour comes to an end, you are now just sitting relaxed in the exam hall with a word processor in front of you, and you're just uh, looking at what you've done in the first one hour and translating them into a letter, a report, a briefing note, putting the headings, converting the points into your own answer, and you're going down writing this in all the 180 minutes you have. Is this, this, is this, is this, is this approach absorbable for all of you? Okay, now one last thing I would like to discuss and then move around the practice platform again. I hope you can see in front of your screen the presentation now. I just want to look into the examiner report for the March, June paper and want to stretch something beyond what we have been discussing since the last one hour. Now, listen to me very carefully. Now, the first thing in the examiner report, while I was looking at it uh, for the March, June paper, examiner has tried telling us something about technical marks in the examiner report. And I want to spend time on that before I move to the professional part. In the technical marks, the examiner is telling us in the March, June 22 report, the marking scheme included 80 technical marks for the correct use and the application of the knowledge. So the critical thing here is the application of the technical knowledge. For every element of technical content, answer needs to be applied, applied to the case. Repetition of rote learned knowledge attracted few, if any, marks. If a question comes on a change process, and you know what a change process is. You unfreeze, you change, and you refreeze. Now, that is the knowledge, right? You can use the headings. Unfreeze, change, refreeze. But what are you writing under unchange, unfreeze, change, and freeze is connected with the information given in the exhibit. You cannot just write the definition of what unfreeze is. You cannot just write the definition of what a change is. You cannot just write a definition of what a rephrase is, rephrase is, or you cannot just give the journal examples of how to go about it. You need to connect the stages. Suppose a question comes on the Mendlow metrics. So you will use the headings, key players, but you will justify the key players in the context of the situation or keep satisfied. You will justify them in the context of the situation or you will use the jargons, high power, high interest, but you'll try to connect that high power and high interest in the context of the case. Yes, to a certain element, the, the knowledge helps you. For example, a question comes on the macro environment. So you will say, okay, you will put the heading political environment, but you will connect the political environment with the case study. So if a question comes on integrated reporting and the examiner is asking for, uh, assess the integrated reporting using the six capitals. So you will not just trying to tell what an integrated report is or what six capitals are. You will just put the heading financial capital and you will connect the financial capital with the case study rather than telling examiner what a financial capital is before you start applying the financial capital to the case study. Is this everyone clear? So again, the model can help you with the headings. The model can help you with the structure of the answer, but you have to connect the headings of the model with the case study. I hope the bullet number one is clear. So it's the application, not the rote learning. No definitions, no explaining of the model, not introducing the model, not telling what the model is that is useless in the SPL paper. Next, technical marks. Demonstration of technical knowledge alone or explanation of a theory does not score marks. This is exactly what I was telling you. 
knowledge alone, putting the Mendlow metrics and telling everything about the Mendlow metrics or telling everything about a macro environment, telling everything about the change process, telling everything about uh, any model in the in the SPL paper is, is useless, right? Till the time that model gets connected with the case study. So a theory does not, a theory does not score marks in SPL paper. To gain a technical mark, candidates need. Now look at this. Examiner saying to gain technical marks, what you need to do. Number one, make point, make point that address the requirement of the task. That is exactly what I've shown you today. Look at the task. What is the task asking you? Is the task asking you to write the benefits of a strategy committee? Then write the benefits of the strategy committee. If the task is asking you to write the problems of a strategy committee, then write the problems of the strategy committee. Make a point. Rather than you start putting a definition of a strategy committee, you're trying telling what is a strategy committee. Suppose a question comes on what are benefits of an audit committee? Rather than explaining what an audit committee is and what an audit committee do, and who, who is in the audit committee, useless. You need just to put benefits of the audit committee, number one, and you extract a benefit from a case study and write it. So make points that address the requirements, that address the requirements. That is the most critical thing you can do in the exam paper. And I've just demonstrated that in the task number one and four. Point number two, show the marker why the point being made was significant. If you say this is the benefit of a strategy committee, why? If you say that the strategy committee should have a finance director, why? If you say that the risk of the flood is high, why? If you say that the company assessment of the risk is inappropriate, why? You cannot score marks in SBL till the time you justify your why. So see, I've given you so many examples. If you say the finance director should be part of the strategy committee, why? If you believe this committee is important to the company because of the strategic challenges they are facing, why? If you say that the risk of flood is wrong, why? If you say the company mitigation activity is wrong, why? Every time you develop a point, you need to justify your why because that why is what the market is looking for. I hope you're clear with the point number two. Point number three, consider issues that were specific to the decision. Now, when you're writing the answer, consider issues specific to the decision. So if, if you are evaluating the proposal for a strategy committee, consider issues specific to the strategy committee. Where? In the exhibit number. I think exhibit number three was that, right? The strategy committee. So for every specific issue given to you in the exam paper, there will be a certain specific information and you will try to find the answer within that specific information. So uh, if you believe that the proposal for a strategy committee is given in the exhibit number three, so I'll fetch most of my answer from the exhibit number three, even though the other exhibits, which I must have read, can help me out with 10% of the answer. But 90% of my answer will come from one specific information given by the examiner. So there was an exhibit number. I think there was an exhibit on the marketing, exhibit number six. Now, every information about marketing will come from that exhibit. But yes, 10 to 15% information can come scattered. So the good thing in SVL paper is there could be one dedicated exhibit which can produce 70 to 80% of your answer and the remaining 10 to 15% can be blended with other exhibits because you will be reading all of them in order. Is everyone clear with the screen in front of you? Make points that address the requirement, show marker why the point being made was significant and consider issues which are specific to the decision. So when you are considering uh, the particular requirement, consider the issues particular to that requirement, not, not just take hypothetical assumptions and drag your answer uh, from left to right and right to left. Is everyone clear with the screen? Yes, that is wonderful, Hafsa. You can use headings on the basis of the case study if you fail to recognize headings as per the model. That is an excellent approach because model isn't the best answer. Model isn't the best answer. So if you fail to pick up model, then you can do what you're trying to tell me. This is an excellent approach, Hafsa. 
Okay, let's next technical marks. Up to two marks were sometime available for a well-developed point made. However, candidates are reminded that two marks will only be awarded when the candidate has successfully identified and explained a relevant point and has then developed it. Have I given you a definition of a well-developed point today? So if you want to fetch two marks per point, it has to be well-developed. And this is a definition of a well-developed point. Evaluating how significant the point is, telling why your point is important, justifying your point, using the information provided in the case study, not out of the case. Uh, consequence, if you're telling this is an issue or this is a problem, trying to write the consequence of that and supporting the point with relevant examples. Look at these four bullets. Did I guided you just a few minutes ago on this? Giving examples, if you're writing a problem, telling the consequence of the problem. If you are trying to write something, please take information out of the case study, not your own information. And more importantly, if you are trying to say this is a benefit or you're trying to say this is important, justifying why this is so important. This is a definition of a well-developed point. I even wrote this on my Word file. Agree or disagree? Did I wrote this definition of a well-developed point even in my Word file? So please ensure you know the definition of a well-developed point. Moving on, technical marks. In, in this sitting, which sitting? March, June 22, March, June 22. In this sitting, candidates often reproduce information taken from the exhibit without explaining why the information was e-strategy committee should meet the information, why the information Sorry, just, just, just let me rephrase this. In this setting, candidates often produced information taken from exhibits without explaining why. Leave this line. Leave this line out. Examples included. Examiner is saying a lot of time the student just reproduced information from the exhibits, not explaining why. And this is exactly what I've, I was guiding you 30 minutes ago that if you try to copy paste something from the case study, you need to rephrase, retranslate that into your own words with the proper justifications, proper reasonings to fetch two marks. Let's see what examples is the examiner giving us where examiner thinks student has not done the why answer. Stating that, stating that justifying the statement in terms of the task that needed to be carried out. I think there's some rephrasing issue. Leave, leave the bullet number one. Look at the first, second one, stating that the payback period for luxury yacht was six years without explaining why this was significant in the context of the risk or the chief executive time horizon. This is something relating to the task number three. He's saying that the student was saying that the payback period for the luxury yacht was six years, but not justifying why it is so important, why it is so significant. Is, is, is the payback period for the luxury yacht six years good or bad, appropriate or inappropriate? So if you say that the payback period for a luxury yacht was six years without explaining this was significant in the context of risk, six years, or the chief executive time horizon or not. So trying to connect, trying to justify the six years in a context, stating that the suggested risk mitigation activity were inadequate without giving reason. This is what we did today, right? Telling that the risk mitigation activity like insurance is wrong, but not justifying why insurance is wrong. So when I when I wrote insurance is inappropriate, I did justify it, that insurance is good for a high likelihood, uh, for a high low likelihood. Insurance is not good for a high likelihood. I did justify my point. So if you just state something, but you're not developing it, you're not connecting it, you're not explaining it, examiner is not liking that. Weaker candidates often just repeated the case material. This happened particularly in the task number five in this setting, where candidates were asked to consider the potential benefits of using the services offered by the advertising agency that could provide for your experiment company. And the students just copy pasted the services from the exhibit number five, not telling why these services are important to Yexperian company. How can these services give competitive advantage to Yexperian company? How can these service increase the market share of Yexperian company, et cetera? But if you just try to quote the services without connecting the service to the competitive advantage, because that was the examiner looking for in that particular task 
we discussed on day two, the examiner is unhappy. So examiner is saying, if you just copy paste something, you reproduce something and you're not giving a why answer with, the, with so many examples coming by the examiner, leaving aside the first one, because that needs some rephrasing. Look at these last three examples here. I hope you're getting the mindset. Are you all clear with this explanation of the examiner? That why, why the examiner was so unhappy with students in March, June 22 exams? Right next, technical marks. Examples included further examples of where the student just reproduced and didn't put the why. Many candidates merely copy and pasted information from exhibit number seven without showing how the services offered would fulfill yex many need. So the advertising services, how would they fulfill the competitive advantage for the yex Marine company? Otherwise, you're not fetching marks. Candidates who presented very generic answers were awarded limited marks. Again, in task number five, some answers discussed e-marketing in journal without referring to the advertising agency services for the need. If you just discuss the e-marketing or the social marketing in journal, but you're not connecting the services offered by the advertising agency and connecting those services with the need of EX Marine or connecting those services with how those services would translate into competitive advantage for EX Marine company, you're not fetching marks. Professional marks, finally. So I hope you're clear on technical marks, linking the answer to case. Uh, if you are reproducing something, uh, justifying that, explaining that, putting them in your own words, developing a proper point, three to four sentences long, uh, try to ensure you're writing the why answer, try to ensure that everything gets connected and synced with the case study, right? Now let's look at a quick drill on professional marks. Many candidates had clearly thought about professional skill marks and attempted to present their answer in an appropriate format as requested. So a format is part of the professional marks, number one. Number two, whatever the format requested, whatever the format requested, very critical line from the examiner, whatever the format requested, the recipient will be helped by an answer that is presented and structured clearly. You're writing a report, you are writing a briefing note, you're writing a letter, you should structure your answer beautifully because the recipient of the briefing note or the recipient of the report or the recipient of the letter will, will feel happy when he looks things in headings and order. See, if I'm reading something or you are reading something, we like to read it if it is presented systematically, sequentially in a proper order. So examiner is saying whatever format you use in exam, please ensure that the recipient is helped. And how would you help recipient? By using headers, headers throughout the answer, structure clearly, and avoid repetitive information. Because if I'm reading something and a certain information keeps coming again and again, again and again, I say, oh, what's the use? So structure clearly, number one, headers, number two, avoid repetition, number three. I, I hope I've given you a definition of a journal professionalism on day two yesterday. Agree, disagree. Was it part of the journal professionalism? What you're looking at in front of your screen currently? Right, number three. <clears throat> Candidates should remember that they are carrying out a professional task that is a particular purpose for a defined user or stakeholder. So I, I told you yesterday that while you are reading the statement, you should demonstrate skepticism, then also read what you have to do and how you have to demonstrate. So I think that particular statement of the examiner, that how you should demonstrate, how you should portray is critical. If any student can pick how to demonstrate and how to portray, you are in a far better position to fetch most of your professional marks. Fault seen on a number of scripts. Now, examiner is telling us what faults have they seen in professional marks in the March, June 22 exam setting. Let's, let's evaluate these faults so you are not repeating them. Number one, over long paragraphs. How, mu how much is the definition of a paragraph I just given you in the session today? Three to four sentences long. Over long paragraphs. At times, the student starts writing and they don't stop. They don't give a para break. They start writing a paragraph 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 sentences long. Is, is that making the recipient happy or the recipient unhappy? Will the recipient 
Will the recipient be happy reading that long paragraph or the recipient will be happy reading the short paragraph, tell me. So over long paragraphs with aspects of task, for example, problem with a proposal discussed in a single paragraph containing all So if you are writing what are problems with proposal and in, in, in terms of the problems with proposal, you write all the problems in one paragraph. There is no break. There is no segregation. If I'm reading it, a marker is reading it. Even you are reading it. I, I need to bifurcate. I need to, oh, okay, this is the first one. Oh, this is the second one. Oh, the, but will that make me happy? Tell me. If I'm reading a congested answer with multiple problems in one paragraph, is that appropriate or should I break the problems? Should I break the problems into one para, one problem, second para, second problem, third para, third problem? So that is lack of professionalism, right? And that will uh, spoil your exam setting. Poor exam techniques. Examiner is not happy. So over long paragraphs with aspects of task. So will you avoid the overlong paragraphs? Will you break every paragraph or every new point you are writing? Everyone? Is that something easy doing? Is that something easy doing? Uh, increasing your prospects of success in the upcoming exams, right? Next, paying attention to the format required. Fault scenes. Some candidates continue to produce essay type answers, no matter what the format is requested. If you just put an essay type format, not to from date subject, not a letter format, not a briefing note format, you are not demonstrating professionalism paying attention to the format required. Because if you just write everything without a format, but you just start to put a heading and an answer, no two from date subjects, no introductions, no conclusions, which most of the time is part of the format, you're not fetching your professional marks. Next, not considering who was receiving the document. Are you writing the document to whom? The chief executive? For example, in the task 2B, candidate was asked to produce a letter addressed to the employees. So if you're writing a letter to an employee, you are trying to communicate the, the stance of the company. Or when you're writing a letter to an employee as a chief executive, you're trying to uh, influence them that whatever the company is doing for you is good. So writing a letter from a CEO to the employee, the tone will be different as if you're communicating and you're trying to enforce things on them. But when you're writing a letter from a consultant to a CEO, the consultant is giving you advice. The consultant is giving you suggestions. The, the consultant is saying, telling you that this is what you did right and this is what you did wrong because he's more in an advising tone. So at times knowing the sender and the receiver also helps you formulate the journal professionalism in the exam paper. Talking throughout the letter about the employees in a third person rather than trying to communicate directly with them in a language used would not help persuade employees that management cared for them. Trust. When you're writing a letter, you should, you should be talking as if you're talking to the person in the first that I would like to do this and I would like to tell you or I would like to suggest you and I, I believe you, you are important to the company or I believe uh, I believe that your role is important to the organization. Without you, we cannot flourish. Try to get into the first person when you're writing a letter. So when you're writing a letter, try to address the person in first, not the third person. That's a simple grammar. That's a simple way of writing letters we learn in our schooling lives. Is, is that clear to all of you? Uh, the four bullets in front of your screen, is that clear to all of you? Okay, moving next, more faults, more faults and professional marks, poor tone and comment made. For example, in task one, when challenging the integrity of the executive directors or the on the strategy committee in a letter addressed to the chief executive, one of the directors. Okay, poor tone and comments, poor tone and comments made. So your tone has to be appropriate. Uh, the tone has to be what the examiner wants you to demonstrate the professional marks, 
Is the examiner wants a questioning tone? Does the examiner wants a tone to focus on the benefits? Does the examiner wants a tone to focus on the problems? Does the examiner wants the tone to be focused on competitive advantage? Look at the tone. So if you are writing something about e-marketing and the examiner wants the e-marketing to be linked to competitive advantage and you're not doing that, your tone is inappropriate. If you are evaluating the proposal and the proposal has to be evaluated with problems and benefits and you're just looking at one side of the picture, you're not, com you're not putting the right tone and comments. Failing to demonstrate sound commercial acumen in making suggestions for risk mitigation activities in task number four, for example, suggesting moving all, all EX Marine operations to high ground. Now, see, this is such unreasonable. I, I, did, I did give a suggestion that once you get the flood warning a week before, you can just transport some of your critical assets to a safe location and bring them back. Now, you're just incurring the transportation cost and the shifting cost. But suggesting that the X-Marine operation should be moved to somewhere high, like a mountain, so you are safe from the floods, is, is that like something uh, practical? Is that something like cost-benefit analysis? So at times, the student gives uh, suggestions which are like out of context. Task four was a good illustration of a professional skill commercial acumen being important, even though another skill skepticism gained the professional marks. In the task four, we need to apply the questioning mindset as well, challenging the assessments of risk made by the management. Professional marks final. Candidates must read technical and professional marks together, as I shown you on the day two. I was reading the technical marks and then I was reading the statement under because the technical marks tell you what you have to do but the professional marks tell you what tone you should keep when you're writing the answer. So if the examiner wants you to evaluate the proposal of the chief executive officer for a strategy committee, the technical, the professional marks will tell you that when you are evaluating, you should look at the benefits and the problems. Now that's how you structure the answer. So that, that is it, right, for the professional marks. Just let's do a quick recap and I'll leave you. Now, I hope over the last three days in particular and the day three, day three in focus today, in terms of your professional marks, I tried giving you a definition on day two, which is extremely important, that if you want to maximize your professional marks, please ensure what steps you need to undertake. And if you want to maximize your technical marks, what steps you need to ensure. Just let's write a quick summary of them together and leave you. Okay, so this is what we were doing in terms of writing the answer today, that when you're writing the answer, this is how you should be going about. Okay, now let's do one final summary. Summary to maximize, summary to maximize the technical and professional marks in SBL paper. Now this is something which would be very important for you. And I think if you just stick to this for your upcoming exams on Tuesday, that would be wonderful. Let's try to make a good summary and you remember this. The point number one in the summary. Now, I believe that when you want to maximize your technical and professional marks in SBL paper, the very first thing which holds the key is the answer is well synced, well-connected, well-integrated, well-embedded, uh, well-embedded uh, with the case study. This is the key. That means we are not writing generic answers. We're not writing any hypothetical answers. We're not writing the answer out of the information presented to us in the case study. The answer is well synced, connected, integrated, embedded with a case study, number one. Number two, each point you are writing must contain a why answer. If you're trying to write a benefit, then why is why it is important. If you're trying to explain a consequence, then you try to explain the implications. 
uh, if you're trying to tell a problem, then justifying why it is a problem in the context of the case. Every point you write, whether it is an advantage or a disadvantage, it is a problem or it is a challenge, it is an issue, everyone needs to be justified in the why context. Each point you're writing must contain a why answer in case context versus in case context versus the uh, need of the requirement, need of the requirement. Number third, when you're maximizing your technical and professional marks, ensure each point uh, starts from a new para and each point is properly, each point is properly headed. Each point starts from a new para and each point is properly headed and no para should be lengthy. No para should be lengthy. The maximum length of a good para is four sentences long. That's next. Maximizing your professional marks, demonstrate the skill, the way the examiner, the way the examiner wants you to demonstrate. Read the read the demonstrate how to demonstrate, how to demonstrate very carefully, very carefully, so you can set the tone of your answer nicely. So demonstration, you should demonstrate commercial acumen, how? You should demonstrate skepticism, how? You should demonstrate uh, evaluation, how? If you read that how very well, what the examiner wants you to do, you are probably structuring the tone of your answer very nicely. And this is something I, I taught you on the day two of this webinar. So demonstration of the skills, uh, the examiner wants you to demonstrate, read how to demonstrate very carefully. So you set them in the very nice manner. Structure your answer in the right format, in the right format with proper layout of the structure, with proper layout of the structure, knowing how to start and end the structure. Use first person where appropriate in writing your answer, like a letter, for example. Ensure you are not losing journal professionalism marks. Journal professionalism marks, which are easier, which are easier, for example, uh, avoiding, which are easier, for example, avoiding repetition, uh, avoiding repetition, avoiding long paras, uh, putting the right format. Ensure you're not losing journal professionalism marks, which are easier, for example, avoiding repetitions, avoiding the long paragraphs, putting the right format in place, and heading uh, and using use headings. At least this is easy, right? At least you're not losing this, which is which is very, very important. Now, the last thing, ensuring we wrote something case specific. Uh, okay, give examples in your answers where needed to justify your points uh, is a good academic, is a good exam practice, but Examples should be from the case, right? Examples should be from case. If you copy paste, rephrase, rephrase the uh, sentence, uh, rephrase the sentence in your own words. That is very important. You're not leaving anything. Uh, copy paste in context, right? I think I've put most of the points. I'm not missing anything. I did talked about a well-developed point, three to four sentences long. Uh, what are attributes of a good point? Case-oriented answers. Even we covered the professional skills yesterday. That how can you maximize marks on professional skills? Uh, headings and subheadings. 
we did discuss about all that yesterday uh, in, in terms of things, right? And the critical analysis we got from the examiner report was mostly focusing on these nine points on your screen. So I hope if you follow the nine on your screen, uh, you will be in a better position to fetch most of your technical and professional marks. So it's about uh, organizing yourself in four hours, the first one hour, and then the three hours. The efforts of the first one hour will translate to your success because you will have good amount of data on the word processor to translate into a good answer. And in the three hours, when you're writing the answer, follow the nine points in front of your screen, stick to the right format, demonstrate the right tone, make the life of the recipient easier. Because if you're making the life of the recipient easier in terms of following a right structure, right tone, right layout, that will impress the marker checking your paper. So the more impress, more uh, try to make your answer impressive, beautiful, nicely laid down, well-structured, well-connected with the case study, and that will impress the examiner. And if you impress the marker, you will pass. Impress your marker. Try putting things, try putting answer uh, beautifully. Beautifully does not mean you're using the colored pens. Beautifully, nicely, professionally uh, to make the life of the marker easier marker easier and you will pass. So it's not coloring the paper. It's just like putting it professionally, headings, subheadings, structures, formats, connected with the case, giving examples, breaking the paragraphs. Your paper looks neat and tidy. That's how you pass the paper. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this uh, webinar. I hope this is coming at the right time, just increasing your motivation levels up come for your upcoming exams on Tuesday. Today is Thursday, right? So the purpose was not to teach you something new. The purpose was just to facilitate you in terms of your motivations. And I hope uh, over the last three days, you got some fine tunings. Have you been able to find some fine tunings uh, which will be helping you on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, before you get to the real exams on Tuesday? Has, has this been beneficial to all of you? And I hope you've read through the new articles, right? The new articles on responsible leadership and the new articles on social and environmental issues because there is a potential that some of them might reflect in your upcoming exams as well. So I hope you still have three, four days more. You can practice on the same pattern guided by, uh, guided by, guided in the webinar. Yes, again, the load of time is the beauty of the SPL exams, right, Kavish? And again, how you utilize the load of time is, is, is your intelligence. And that one hour and three hour split is the best practice, right? So I wish you all the best of luck. Uh, and I wish that you continue uh, doing the right practice in the next three to four days ahead of your exams. And whenever you, in your actual exam, don't again panic. Just look at the screen. Just look at the case study. Just go about reading the case study as guided to you in the webinar. Just uh, understand the information, absorb the information. And in the three hours with the absorption of the information, you need to translate a wonderful answer. Every step guided, if you implement most of them, you will be successful in the upcoming exams, right? Take very good care of yourself. Uh, and I am your tutor, Kashif Kamran, and I'm signing off from this day three of the SPL webinar to success and i hope you enjoyed this uh and very best of luck for your upcoming exams take care goodbye and allah hafiz all of you if you have any questions you can put on the whatsapp group thank you